Hello and welcome to the Nikon Creators Hour. My name is Mike Corrado. I've been with Nikon for over 35 years and I've been taking pictures for over 40. And I'm here with Vincent Versace, who has inspired me so many times with the pictures that he creates and his knowledge of editing and how you deal with files in the computer. Vincent, welcome. How are you doing? I'm well. I uh, I'm, can't complain. No, that's Life's good. How you're, you're in Los Angeles right now. We are talking across the country. That's what blows me away about modern technology, right? It's like we are talking across the country, and it used to be that was an expensive phone call when we were kids. Now it's the internet. Or it was a big expensive cell phone that cost you like $25 a second back in the day. Um, but this is great. It's great to be able to see you. We're kind of working our way through the pandemic, and you know, we're at a point in time now where things are starting to open up again. Um, how are you and your loved ones? How, how's everybody doing over the last several months? I think we're blessed in the fact that we live in Los Angeles because we have more room and there's plenty of space to walk around and stuff. I, uh, my heart goes out to people that have to live in a city and stay that tight. Um, mm -hmm. It's been interesting to be earthbound. Um, I'm not one that's used to staying in one spot for any great length of time. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I photograph my backyard. My cats are looking at me now like, no, 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 no. Talk to my agent. And do you say one more shot? Just one more, Kitty. Just, Just one, one more shot. Come on, come on Kitty. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm going to brag on you a little bit. I, I'm sorry. I didn't want to cut you off. Go ahead. No, no. I was going to say um, facial recognition, Kitty follow focus is great. When you put it in silent mode, you sneak up on them. That's so funny. We, I'm going to brag on you a little bit. I, I, again, I, I opened up by saying this is I think you're one of the most extraordinary photographers I've ever met. You way of landscape portrait. Um, your editing skills are second to none. You put a lot of time into that. Um, define yourself as a photographer, how you got started in this business, and what made you want to pick up a camera? Um, I bought my first photograph or first camera in a yard sale when I was seven. Um, I have two uncles. Both are photographers. One of them's a wedding photographer. He got roped into babysitting me, brought me into the dark room showed me you know the magic dance over underneath the enlarger put it in the developer i watched the picture come up oh my god got a whiff of fixer and i was done mm -hmm. just done and then um when i was nine i took a picture and it was this uh, of this animal in a trash can and i sold it to the local newspaper for uh 50 bucks so i sold my first professional photograph when I was nine. Granted, it was a local newspaper and it was some photo contest, but you know, if we stretch the truth a little bit. And then when I went into high school, I, I did my first wedding, charged $250 for it, cost me $485 to shoot it. So I'm obviously a good enough businessman to be a photographer. Um, and just all throughout my life, I've been taking pictures. Or should they I be know. taking me? Total, total passion of both of ours. And I think we share that same story. My story, my dad with a dark room, the whole fixer, this image came from nothing in this orange lit room. Um, and and uh, he had built his own dark room. And it was fascinating. It was a fascinating process. Uh, as you travel along the way, I mean, define yourself as a photographer now. You know, you sold that first picture. What is it that you love to do? What, what creates, you know, that energy in you and the passion for taking pictures now versus when you started? I... I really like going on the journey. I, I like being taken. Um, I listen to people talk all the time about how they take pictures. And the best advice I could ever give somebody is don't do that. Be taken. Let the camera, let you hold the camera and let the image rip you through the lens. Instead of you trying to drag it through, you go on the ride. Like there, there are two schools of thought. You know, um, Angela Adams said, without pre-visualization, Photography is nothing more than a five-finger exercise. And uh, Paul Caponegro said, if you believe in pre-visualization, you deserve what you get. They're both right. It's like the only thing I ever pre-visualize is I prepare to be amazed. And when I take the picture, where the picture takes me, it's at that moment that I see the final image on a wall, and that's what I work towards by removing everything that isn't the image that's in my head. But it's mm -hmm. always about being taken. It's always about being a participant of the moment and being connected to it. Not affecting it, but 
letting the moment take you and creating images that when you look at them, the viewer can feel what it felt like to be standing where you were when the moment grabbed you. And that to me is important, whether it's photographing fruit or it's photographing world events or photographing a tree. There is an emotional connection that you need to slow down to the speed of life for to, to receive. And when you receive that, that's when the power of the photograph happens for me. That's, that's beautifully stated, and, and that's so, so true. Um, you put together a collection of images for us. Um, we laugh about this all the time with these types of interviews. You have to call down your decades oh of work into you know, a short portfolio of pictures, but that's what makes this more challenging and more fun. Before we get to that first picture, I, I would define myself as a guy that takes pictures I do very little on the post-production end, you know, because I just don't know enough about the process. So I do enough to get by. Just share the sentiment about why it's so important to not only consider the front end of shooting, but the back end of editing and how you tie those two things together and why people should consider getting into more education about editing if they are not like, you know, like me, if they're like me <laughs> and don't do a ton of editing. Oh, listen to you. Oh my God, you've become quite the interviewer. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, no, it's like, I believe that every decision about every image has to happen at the moment of capture, period. Everything you're going to do, everything about it, as you're pushing the shutter down, that's when that happens. Now, the more you understand about the middle, the more informed those decisions at point of capture can be. And everything you do is in service of something. And what's in service of is the final image which is the print and here's the disconnect i think that i find frequently what's the print in service of the final image it's in service of your voice which happened where at moment of capture so you're traveling a circle you're just doing it in a straight line mm -hmm. so the more i understand what i can do what i need how focus works how blur works um what are the limitations of post-processing how do i get the most out of my raw file all the way down to what makes the best final image because every image that makes it through post-processing is made into one 16 by 20 print. Everything mm -hmm. gets printed. I think that if you're gonna be a great photographer, you have to print. Ansel Adams said, the greatest photographers in the world are the greatest printers, but the greatest printers are not necessarily the greatest photographers. That mm -hmm. understanding the final image makes it so that when you're at point of capture, you have a better understanding of what you need to convey what took you and to move somebody in a way in which you were moved. So yeah, the more you know about all the stuff, the better off you are. And that's why I'm a, as much a gearhead as I am. And when I shoot, I promptly forget it. And as much as a technologist as I am. And again, when I shoot, I don't go there. I, I let the camera do the heavy lifting and I, make sure that I have a properly exposed image and all the parts that I need. Excellent. Excellent. Let me, um, let me bring up your pictures cause this is where it gets really fun. Uh Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> let's, let's push us to the side because nobody wants to look at us anyway. And, and let's bring up uh, the images, some that you selected. Um, oh, this one. when we get into these, I just want to say again, we, we know you shoot an icon. We know you're an icon ambassador. We know, you know, that you love the product, but this is really about your journey for each of these pictures that you selected. So start off with this image and tell us everything about it. I'm in Egypt. I'm in Cairo. I'm on a gig. And um, I'm with a friend of mine, Lou Jones, who shoots film. We're both on the same gig and I'm shooting digital. And he's giving me nothing but grief about shooting digital and what a waste of time it is. And I'm just looking at him going, Lou, every dog has its day. And so we're, and I know this sounds funny, we were in a used camel lot in Egypt where they sell used camels. And so, and camels are the nastiest, smelliest, noisiest, just they're not fun creatures to be around. And I am knee deep, they're knee deep in camels everywhere. And you hear, ah, ah, ah. and when a male camel is in heat, he has a bag of goo that's on the side of his face that he sprays the female camel with to say, hey. So I see this guy and I put my camera up and I say, can I shoot him? And I get, 
and I'm and I go okay. And as I turn, this male camel's face comes right in front of my camera and goes and coats me in all of that goo, and I stink to high heaven. Lou mm-hmm. is cracking up because he thinks it's the funniest thing he's ever seen. I've got camel, whatever, dripping off the lens, dripping off the camera, dripping off me. And I look at this guy. He looks at me and he goes, and I take one frame, that frame. Mm. And then we're done. He paid me for having to go throw away my clothes. All right. So I post process this picture. I put it up and all of a sudden it gets all sorts of interest and everybody likes it. And to this day, people come up to me and tell me that that is their most favorite National Geographic cover that they've ever seen ever. Hmm. I've never been on the National Geographic. <laughs> so, okay. I, I wish Nat Geo would have picked up that cover because it would have been something. But mm-hmm. I think the point of it is, at least for me, every one of my photographs has a story behind it. and. I view the pictures as just snapshots, postcards of like the vacation that is my life. I get that I have a job that is most people's hobby. Mm-hmm. I, it's thoroughly not lost to me. And I get that I am absolutely, utterly, and completely blessed to see the world through a camera. And mm-hmm. I get that that opens up so many doors and I've been to so many amazing places and it has taught me so much about life. And mm-hmm. Yeah, when I see that picture, you see a portrait of a Bedouin. When I see that picture, well, I, I have other sensory and olfactory remembrances of it. Mm-hmm. Like use camels in a lot and spit from <laughs> well, camel. I've, act- I've actually been spit on by a camel, so it's another similarity that we have um, while we were out shooting. You know what I'm once. talking um, about then. The, uh, the look on this gentleman's face, the character. There's a lot of character in a lot of all the portraits that you shoot. Um, the connection with this man. You say you knocked out one picture. How do you make that instant connection to get that kind of look outside of the camera saliva? Is there anything you're doing to communicate with the people you photograph? I'm not in my pictures. And I know that's a hard, I can talk all around the idea. Okay. I've not been accused of being a man of small ego. And I appreciate that may be true, but I can promise you that with regard to when I'm in the moment of capturing an image, I believe that it's what's occurring in front of the photograph that needs to take me. And so I am open to the gift of what's in front of me. So I don't put any commentary on it. I just, when I feel that tug of, oh my God, that's cool. That's the impulse to take it. Now, Mm -hmm. as to how I get where I go with portraiture, um, I don't walk in with the attitude of, oh my God, look at me with all the fancy equipment, yada, yada, yada. What I try to do is minimize all of that in the fact that I just want to be as not intimidating as possible. And one of the things that I frequently use to my advantage is the language I speak fluently, which is silly. Everybody is willing to laugh and smile at the big, tall, goofy guy. And they're willing to give it up if they feel comfortable around you. The other thing that I do is I don't walk in like I own the place. I try to become part of the place. Um, the photographer Dwino, when commenting about how all of his pictures had the most amazing backgrounds, said he finds the stage and the players come. So what he does is he walks in, finds where he wants the background to be, sets up his camera, sits down and waits. And eventually right. life moves in. With right. this, while I was photographing um, all of the camels, I'd been standing next to this guy for a good 15, 20 minutes. So he was comfortable with me and used to me, and I was kidding around with him a little bit. So he'd you know, begrudgingly give me a hmm, ha, laugh and whatever. But I, once he said no, I didn't make it a point to photograph him. And it wasn't until events occurred where his camel coated me in camel goo that he looked at me, I looked at him and I must have been a sight because he started smiling and cracking up. And then when I pulled the camera up, he gave me the serious face, took the picture and I got, and it was just this, you know, mano y mano moment, you know, human to human, spirit to spirit. And the key, like I don't ever go up to somebody and say, here, let me give you a dollar, can I take your picture? 
Mm -hmm. A couple of events occur when you do it that way. Um, first off, you always get the expression and you start to create a society of beggars. What I try to do is I try to find the, the luxury that they don't afford themselves but mean something to them. Like in Cuba, it's cigars. So I get these little cigars. In uh, Morocco or Egypt, it's bonbons, little candies, these caramel candies that, they, that they're very fond of. And I give those as a gift to thank the person for allowing me the privilege of being able to photograph them that it's the gesture that is more important. And that is the thing that I have found over the years that matters most. Now, I try to do good with my pictures and tell the story of the humanity that I see or the beauty that I see. That's, that's my job. My job is to tell the truth and see the pretty and right. to point the world out around us. Because there's enough people that photograph man's monumental inhumanity to man, and they're much better at it than I am. But there's not enough people saying, this is the beautiful place you live, be it the beauty of the person inside or the simplicity of the flower in front of you or the beauty of the sunset that just occurred to in front of you. My job is to record that and show it. And my right. job is to record the stories of life as it crosses my path. And that's this guy. Beautiful. <laughs> I have been in love with this picture for a long time. What's going on here? Obviously, it's a, it's a beautiful close-up image of a flower, but talk about it. Um, it's a California poppy right after um, two and a half weeks of rain in San Francisco. I was commissioned to photograph the San Francisco Presidio. And so I was stuck inside because the rain was so torrential that um, I couldn't shoot. So I was a bit mm -hmm. stir-crazy much like I am now. Um, and so I dragged my fixer out, a guy named Warren White, and I want to photograph California poppies. I want to photograph flowers. Now, there are no poppies in April. So he knows the one place where the one poppy is. And so I'm looking for it, and I'm going around, where, where, where? And my foot gets caught in this giant root, and I move forward as I see it, and I'm falling forward. and I snap the picture and then I proceed to bury the lens into that flower and bury the camera into the mud. And so when I pulled the camera out, right with this, the sound, and um, you remember Richard, right? Lepinto? Mm -hmm. Having explained to him why I needed to have that camera repaired and cleaned was not a conversation I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And so I photographed this, and the name of this is called If I Were a Raindrop. Now, there are some expletives that were in that, because when I looked at it, it was expletive. After, expletive. If I was an expletive raindrop, I'd want to be that expletive raindrop, but you can't name a photograph that. So it's If I Was a Raindrop, and it became one of my most iconic photographs, and it's also one of the photographs that I learned the concept, started learning the concept of bokeh. Mm -hmm. That the importance of blur in an image is equal to the importance of the sharpness of an image. And mm -hmm. that all has to do with the background and the play of color and how we move the eye through the photograph, which this is the start also of the observation that we don't really create photographs. What we do is we create optical illusions. And mm -hmm. all the pictures that we make are coin tricks. And it is the mission of the person, this gets to your question about the middle, of the person capturing the image to do it in such a way that we choose where the eye goes because it's human perception that matters in a photograph, not 17th century painting theory. And if we pay attention to the biomechanics of human vision, we can create more successful images based on the way the eye wants to see an image when it looks at it. And this is a prime example of it. Mm -hmm. It absolutely is. And in fact, it's a nicer example that every time you put your hand up in front of your camera and the focus goes to your hand, the bouquet <laughs> on you is beautiful. So I just, you know. <laughs> I um, I'm Italian. I'm Italian. Mm -hmm. I sit on my hands. I can't talk. 
Talk a little bit about color here, though, because the color palette is just, it works. And it, you don't even have to explain it to your mind. It just works. Talk about color within your photos. Well, all right. So it is the ownership of color is the most important thing. I'll keep my hand down here. The ownership of color is the most important thing in any photograph, whether it is black and white chromatic grayscale or a full color image. Um, by having total control of the color, the way in which the color is rendered, the way in which the color is controlled, the way in which the color is calibrated on the monitor, the way in which the color is outputted. If you control color, you win. It's the ownership of how color goes that matters. Now, if we look at 17th century painting theory, this breaks every rule of 17th century painting theory. Um, Grecian mean says that uh, because we read left to right, top to bottom, the more powerful part of the photograph is the lower right-hand side of the image. Okay, well, the focus of this image is to the left, not the right. And the reason for that is, is because that works compositionally. It's not, oh my God, I have to follow the rule of thirds. Oh my God, I have to follow these rules. What I have to do is make the picture look cool. And so what I wanted was an area of attack and an area of retreat. The area of retreat is the blur. The area of attack are all the little nooks and crannies in the image that are of focus. So by controlling how the eye sees, by interrupting patterns and controlling the saturations of color and the qualities of color, like if you look at the flower, the oranges and reds are moving forward in the picture. Warm colors in a photograph move forward, cool colors recede. So the dimensionality that occurs, and you really see this in the print, is because the warmer colors are a little bit more saturated than the cooler colors behind it. And that two to 5% in differential is what causes the image to move forward. Again, getting back to the idea of optical illusions. Mm. So that what I have is I want your eye to go here, I want your eye to see the flower, but I need to have an, a place for your eye to rest, which is the blur. And by making the blur pretty, um, and interesting that pattern that exists there, what happens is you have something to look at. A pattern is interesting, but a pattern interrupted is more interesting. And the pattern that is interrupting the image is actually the hardness of the flower in the power, the, the uh, pattern of the, of the blur. And having the purples and the greens, I don't know if that's rendering on the screen or not, um, that is in the background are complementary colors to the oranges and yellows of the flower, which again causes that flower to move forward. So it's all about where you want the eye to go and how you want the eye to, to track and see it. And Outstanding. It is Outstanding. Content I'm creator. sorry. <laughs> I didn't oh, mean no, to no, jump no. on you. That's well, okay. speaking of color, <laughs> shifting over, I know you're a black and white master as well. So um, talk about how important this image. You've talked to me about this image before, and it's beautiful. Uh, and it's a great, great story. So tell everybody viewing, you know, why, why this image uh, and why did you select it? Well, if I had to pick the image before this and this image are probably my two most iconic images. Um, a friend of mine several years ago uh, had this thing. So if you could pick one photograph and that was it, what would be the photograph that you would use to represent your career? And it used to be that flower. And now it's this. And that's because it's on the, the box product for Epson Cold Press Natural. It's the cover of my um, third book. And it gets a lot of airplay. The story is funny in that um, 2009 had to be about the roughest year we had business-wise, right? Mm -hmm. I would say. It's, it's a year we all wish we could forget. Uh, not taking in 2020. Um, but prior to 2020, that was a hard year. And so I get this call, do you want to go to Paris um, for a convention? All you need to do is get there. We'll put you up in a hotel, and you can eat off of all the craft service tables, and you just need to be available to talk about photography. Okay. I have a bazillion frequent flyer miles, and I have no work until, you know, from the day they asked me, in February to a perspective point into infinity. So I get on an airplane, I buy the last, I get the last ticket 
on the last Lufthansa flight, the day before I have to be there, um, I'm in the last row in the middle on a 747 mm. in between two guys that make me look small that had not discovered soap. Oh. And the chair in front of me, because the person was of that same uh, girth, broke. And so I'm stuck in this chair like this for the entire flight over to Paris. Okay, get off, get out, go through three hours worth of customs, because the Gaul is tough. And it's sunset, two, two, three hours in rush hour traffic, get to the air, get to the hotel, go in, check in, I get this key, I put on the concierge club class floor, I'm zipped up to the 25th floor of this hotel, and there is this carnelian marble table of all of the cheeses and charcuterie and breads and champagnes that you could possibly want. It's like all the cows, pigs, and sheep contributed to this. And the um, bellhop says, follow me, sir. And we go down this hallway, and I'm thinking, wow, big spread, private hallway. I'm getting a huge room. So I walk by, and I see the sign that basically says, um, La Machine de Elevator. Okay. So we walk by this door. He opens it up the door, and the door hits the bed. And the bathroom is a combination toilet, shower, and sink. And the closet, if you hang your clothes up, half of your shirts hang out of the closet. And the back window is completely fogged up from the HVAC system for the hotel. Great. And so the the bell bellman says would you like some earplugs and so i don't know why and he goes you will so i have my luggage in the bathroom my luggage on the bed i'm standing on the bed so that he can leave the door closes the room shakes and i'm convinced we're going to have an earthquake i'm from san francisco so i run for the the door frame and then it stops and i look at the door and on the back of every door is this um placard for the fire escapes and when i look at it and that changes no matter how they refurbish the hotel and they just refurbish this hotel it always stays the same and what it said was basically linen closet in french so they had converted the linen closet for this floor into a hotel room i go down the hallway put the card key in go down talk to the guy at the front desk and i said look you put me in a linen closet he said sir our rooms are no longer linen closets I'd like to be moved. You have the class or room that you deserve. I'd like to speak to the general manager. He's not here. When's he going to be in? 7.30. Okay, great. I'm going to go eat food. I'm Italian. I like to eat. Get in the elevator. Go back up. Put the can of heat slot. Get there. The lounge is closed, but I can drink all the coffee I want. Great. Great. So I've been up now 27 hours go to sleep, put my sweats on, and every time I fall asleep, the elevator shakes my room, I bolt up. So I get up at seven o'clock in the morning, walk down the hallway, get into the elevator, put my card key into the L slot, go all the way down, walk up to the front desk, and all I have on is a cashmere overcoat that I bought at Century 21 for cheap, but pretty, and a pair of sweats. And there's this bald-headed gentleman in a beautiful suit but his back's towards me and i just look at him and go i'd like to speak to the hotel general manager now <laughs> and the guy turns around and he goes i am the hotel general manager and i look at him and as he leans forward his suit says versace on the inside his tie versace 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 on his eyeglasses versace his belt buckle has a medusa on it and all i'm thinking is I own you. <laughs> so I figure in for a penny, in for a pound, right? So I said to him, I cannot believe that you would put me in a linen closet. And he says, sir, there, our rooms are currently not linen closets. And I go, the one I am is. He says, well, you're in the room you deserve. What is your room number? So I give him the room number. He goes, monsieur, you got the room that you buh. And he looks up at me and he goes, I, 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 I just put my hand up. No, fix it. He goes, I said, I said, fix it. I'm going for breakfast. Breakfast is not us. I don't take care of it. It's like, so 
I take four steps forward, I stop, turn around, and I look at him, I go, nice tie. Go down. Now, keep in mind, I'm barefoot, in sweats, with nothing on but a T-shirt and this overcoat. So tell, I go tell downstairs. Tell me nightmare ends. Tell me. Tell, this is, sounds like a nightmare. I don't know if I've ever had a hotel experience like this. But, oh, it gets uh, better. Yeah. All right, so I, I get down to the dining room table, or the, the dining room. There's a table for 12 with just my name placard on it. I sit down, and I have every waiter in the world bringing me stuff. Okay, great. Cafe Americano. Okay, great. Fresh baked bread. All of a sudden, the concierge walks down, slow walks downstairs and says, Mr. Versace, please follow me. Your room is ready. Okay, great. And he goes, pointing to stuff. We get into this elevator. He puts another card in another slot. We're zipped up to the ninth floor. And where there were like 30 rooms on the floor I was on, there were six rooms on this floor. We slow walk down the um, hallway. He puts the key in the card slot. We open up. And what I have is the corner suite with a balcony, wraparound balcony, kitchen, bedroom, dining room, living room. And all of my stuff has been put in the room and all of my clothes are hung up. He hands me his card, the key, and says, if you need anything, um, don't hesitate to call me. And at that moment, it was as if he had cued the snow. And it never snows in Paris. And I get this mm -hmm. blizzard. And so I grab my camera, I put it on a tripod, I open up the door and I go, wow, it's cold outside. Put the tripod on, close it, have the remote hooked to it. And just as I'm getting ready to take a picture right here, Open up the door. Mr. Versace, the bread that you like. Great, thanks. Fruit basket. Bottle of champagne. And they just kept knocking and bringing stuff. And I'm sitting here drinking this cup of coffee that they had brought me, taking this picture. It's the only picture that I got in two weeks in Paris, but it was that photograph. Mm. And um, again, it's the stories behind the pictures, I think, are far more interesting frequently than the actual pictures. No, but this is, this there's is some lessons that were, were learned here. One of the lessons I learned is that timelessness in a city occurs from the fourth floor and above. You can tell the, the, the modernness of the city from the third floor and below, where all the banners are for whatever's happening, the lights, the neon. But the age of a city is held above the fourth floor. So when you're looking at this picture, when was it shot? Mm hmm and I think the goal, one of the goals to put in composition is, as Maisel puts it, light, gesture, and color are the key elements of any photograph. And because I can't leave well enough alone, light, gesture, color, and timelessness are the key elements of any photograph. If you can create an image where there feels like there's a moment before and there's a moment after, and you're catching the arc between, that the decisive moment is the arc between moments, and when you look at it, you don't know when. So I could have shot that 100 years ago. I could have shot that um, five days. Well, no, I could have shot that in February if it snowed. But there's no way to tell when. So by keeping the when, I create an image that holds timelessness. And timelessness, I think, is an important aspect of a photograph to have. So, so important. The Taj Mahal. Talk about this picture. Um, this is an, an interesting photograph and there's a concept in Spolin technique, which is an acting technique called the truth and the lie. The truth is this is the most viewed photograph of the New York times for, um, 19 or uh, 2011. Impressive. The lie in that truth is why. Okay. So the story of this is I argued with my fixer that I did not want to photograph the front of the Taj Mahal because everybody photographs the front of the Taj Mahal. And I am thoroughly fascinated, and I don't know why, but it's one of these just weird things that we pick up over life. I am fascinated by the back of malls, you know, where the loading docks are and stuff. That, that just fascinates me how something can look so pretty in the front and it can be a total mess in the back. And so what I wanted to see was the back of the mall. So we get into this big whole thing, and I drag, get this guy to take me across the river, and he basically goes, see, there, there. It's not as pretty. And I'm just going, oh, yeah, it is. So I took this picture. Um, my book was coming out 
on black and white. I got asked to do an article on black and white for the tech page for the New York Times. Great, you know, fluff piece, little article, not many people are gonna watch it. Why it was the most viewed photograph was that on the day they ran the article was the day they ran Stephen Jobs' obituary. So yes, there's a reason why people looked at that picture. It had nothing really to do with the picture, even though it's a very strong picture and it's one of my favorite photographs. But mm -hmm. I'll take it, because it's nice to be able to say, just like I sold my first photograph when I was nine, even though it was a contest in the local newspaper, it's nice to be able to say that, yeah, I had one of the most viewed pictures in the New York Times. But this is all about telling the story of Timeless. Exactly when was this shot? Because if we, the way the caste system works in India, most likely the guy that's down there fixing the fence, his family has been doing that job since the Taj Mahal was erected because on the other side of the fence, is the emperor's garden, the emperor that uh, built the Taj Mahal. It's his private garden. And he's in charge of maintaining it and keeping the fence up. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful story, too. Placement is everything, isn't it? <laughs> um, Being lucky, yeah. <laughs> where are we here? Um, we are in Myanmar. And this is one of my, uh, probably my most life-changing experience as a photographer um, and it started 12 years before to do this I was the photographer for a TV show called eco challenge and my job was to photograph all of the cold open shots for every episode and um, there was a another journalist there that he was on his last assignment if he didn't pull it off he was fired and was never going to work again and we became friends and drinking buddies. And he couldn't get um, across the, uh, the barrier of the production line. That security wouldn't allow him pass and he could only go with the press pool. And his job was to follow the Playboy team. He was hired by Playboy magazine and the Playboy team consisted of three Playboy bunnies and one ex-Navy SEAL. And so I took pity on him and because I had total access for everything, including the helicopters, and I could go anywhere I wanted because of my job, I took him on board the boat. He got the story that he wanted and told me that if he could ever pay back the favor, he would. And I just thought it was the right thing to do to help some guy out. So cook to 10 years later, I'm meeting the new, the, the just tired new editor-in-chief of American Photo Magazine. And we sit down and uh, having a lunch uh, right across the street from the offices. And he looks at me and he goes, Vincent Versace, I owe you a favor. Never met the guy. And having the editor in chief of American Photo telling that he owes you a favor on your first meeting, that's a pretty good thing, right? Popular magazine, go, very popular. Yeah, and he goes, yeah, so, and I go, okay, great, why? And then he tells me the story about his best friend was the guy who I helped out when he was at his lowest and I saved his job and his career and now he's, he's flourishing. And he promised that if he could ever do me a solid, he would. Okay, and he says, what would you like to do? And I said, I'd like to do an article on Myanmar. And he goes, okay, let's do an article on Myanmar, to which I said, in infrared. Okay, great. So then I decided I want to photograph Aung San Suu Kyi. So I started sending her emails about how I'm a Hollywood photographer and I'll do this and I'll give her all the pictures, but I want to do this piece for American Photo and I want to talk about the emerging culture of the country coming out of its pariah status and yada, yada, yada. To which I finally get an email back that says, I neither perceive myself nor see myself as an actress or a model, so no. And I'm thinking, well, okay, at least I have a chance then. So I keep hitting her with emails and letters, and I go through my fixer uh, in Myanmar. And finally she says, access may be granted if you promise to do right with your images. Sure. I have no idea what that means, but sure. So I am the only Westerner allowed to photograph her as he had just been released 
from being under captivity. She's not allowed to speak to me because if she talked to me, she'd be talking to a Western journalist and she would be put back in, um, you know, uh, isolation in her house. Keeping in mind that um, she speaks fluent English, grew up in English or in England and has a degree from the um, London School of Economics and was married to an Oxford professor. Mm -hmm. So we're standing, I'm here, my fixer is here, her assistant is here and her best friend is here and she's here. So we're right across the way from each other. And so I say to my fixer, could you ask Dao Su Chi um, what the word is for please? I know how to say thank you, but I can't seem to find somebody to tell me the word for please. And when I say this, I get this look like, oh, honey, I'm so sorry that I'm about to hit you with the spiritual two by four. So this goes from my fixer to her assistant, her assistant to her best friend to her in Burmese. And she's looking right at me. It's like that Lucille Ball episode where they're going back and forth with the translations. So she says something to her best friend and her best friend just gets all, I can't say that. And she goes, yes. And says it to his assistant. He looks at her and says, yes. Says it to my fixer. My fixer looks at her and says, yes, I, I, I can't. And she said, go on. And so what he says to me is this, we are a polite society and please and thank you is implied in absolutely everything we do. Mm. There is no word for please. And thank you is something we only say if circumstance warrants it. You say thank you too much to people here in Myanmar and it makes them uncomfortable. Why don't you mm. consider just having please and thank you be implied in everything you do and just do right. And I'm sitting there. What do you say? It's like I'm talking to a, you know, I'm talking to Gandhi, you know, and Mandela in one person. And I'm just beside myself. And that just stood with me. And ever since that moment, I came with a couple of realizations. First, the pen is mightier than the sword. Okay. The camera is mightier than the pen. Right. And I wield a lightsaber. And my job is to tell the truth, see the pretty, and do right with every photograph that takes me. That is my job. And in life, my job is to do right by everything I do and every person I come in contact with. That's my mission. Um, mm -hmm. And so at that moment, I realized that I had a responsibility, which was to do right. And I, um, this is that moment right after where she is talking to all of the people in that photograph. The guy behind her, the guy next to her, and the guy across from her spent 20 years in um, self-confinement in the prison, um, in solitary confinement for political reasons, for trying to make the country not be a dictatorship. And the attitude that took me about all of those people in that photograph was they had forgiven their captors and they were trying to move forward. And it's important to be able to forgive. And it is important to understand what that means. And it's important to understand the concept of doing right. And through no fault of my own, I've been given a gift. My job is vision. I didn't earn it. I didn't do anything to get it. It just is. I, I see the world or I'm allowed to see the world because I can slow down to it. Maybe that's the, the big lesson, but it's not anything to brag about. It's just simply something that is. And so the power of the photographs comes from the fact that the subject drives the picture. I don't drive the picture. All I do in post-processing is remove everything that doesn't belong in the picture to make the picture more successful. Just like Michelangelo viewed sculpting as the rock was the living rock and he removed everything that wasn't the sculpture and freed the sculpture from the stone. The same holds true with a file. Ah, right. uh, this one, like this here. This is a um, Beautiful thing. eight hours by car, three hours by more car, eight, nine hours by boat up the Awadi River to photograph tattooed faced women. Mm -hmm. Now there's a belief and it's part of this article 
there's a belief in Southeast Asia that the most beautiful women of Southeast Asia come from Burma, Myanmar. And the most beautiful women of Myanmar come from this one village, which is up in the Rakhine State, up the Irrawaddy River. And so it's during monsoon season. We're going up the river, and the rains would hit. We'd be bailing out the boat. We'd barely get to shore and have to tip the boat over to get the water out so it doesn't sink. I finally get to this village, and all I know is I am photographing me some tattooed faced women, damn it. That's just it. I've spent too much time. I, and there's nobody in this village. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nobody in this village. And I'm, and so I'm walking through this village and I hear this most beautiful bird like, bell like voice. Are you looking for me? And I look all around and I don't see anything. It's like, I can't come down, but if you want to photograph me, I'll let you. And so I think, smart photographer that I am, look up. And there is this woman who has to be one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. And she's 87 yes. years old, which is 25 years older than the life expectancy of a Burmese woman. And I am just floored. And now her face is very, very dark skinned. And I photographed her in IR, I could barely see the tattoos, but infrared pulled out all of the tattoos. So the minute I pulled up the camera, she gives me the first head up. And then I look and I go, really? And she gives me that look. And then I look at her and I go, oh, come on. And she starts backing up. And the journey's a destination. Was it worth going all that way and all that way back for these three photographs? Absolutely. And the story mm -hmm. I have about being stuck on the Awadi River during um, monsoons and traveling through this village and getting to meet this spirit and then going back two years later to show her the pictures when we went back up, it, it was the journey that made it important. Right. And it's understanding what's the best tool at the moment of capture to accomplish the task at hand. All of that is the more you understand the middle, the better choice you can be giving yourself at the beginning. Right. And does it matter to understand Photoshop? Yeah. Does it matter to understand uh, post-processing software? Yes. Does it matter to understand printing? Yes, because they all intertwine. They're all part of the whole experience. Right. And photography is not just Instagram. Mm -hmm. It's the print. It's the moment. It's being part of the whole experience. Absolutely. I love this and this uh, uh, just a beautiful person. Um, where are you here and what's the story behind this image? This is the image in which was the catalyst of a project that I'm working on called turning the last page. It's a self project. So we, uh, there's a, the highway system, the roads in Myanmar are euphemistically referred to as the Burma superhighway. There, there are chuck holes in these roads that are so deep that when you hit them, you're convinced that Columbus was wrong and the world is flat. I mean, it, it's crazy. So we're three hour drive to get to this location to photograph this sunrise. I photograph this amazing sunrise. And now what? And I look up and there's smoke coming over this hill and where there's smoke, there's fire. Okay, great. Let's go there. So I walk into this village, which is a village that makes nothing but bricks. Mm -hmm. And it's bricks as far as the eye can see, but nothing but bricks. And there are children running everywhere and it's a Wednesday and they're not in school because there is no school in this area. And Myanmar right now has like a 94% a literacy rate but none of the kids in this area can read and all they're going to do is grow up to make bricks and the men die at 52 and the women die at 57 and the average life expectancy when I was there was 62, 67, I think I may have gotten that right, but in the early sixties. Right. So I'm just taken by that. And all they're going to do is make $3 a day making bricks by hand and digging them. And the basket on this girl's head is the basket that she used to get clay. And she hauls the clay to this, 
to be made into bricks that are then put in this mound that's put on fire. And it was at that moment that it dawned on me what I was supposed to do, which was I will be damned if I am going to allow this to happen here. If I can do something to change it, I'm going to do it. So what I want to do is put together a book. And at this point, my fixture says to me, yeah, it's like turning the last page of the 19th century. At which point I said, that's what this project is, turning the last page of the 19th century, Myanmar, turning the last page of 1962, Cuba, turning the last page of the British Raj, India. And I want to feed some hungry kids in India. I want to build a school in Myanmar. And I want to put cameras in the hands of photographers that would never see the technology I am allowed to embrace, to look at, see, and have known throughout my career. Because mm -hmm. my job is to help bring forth innovation. My job is to help nurture the creative spirit. That is what I view I'm put on this planet to do. And it was that photograph where I just went, I got what Aung San Suu Kyi had told me a couple of years prior, what doing right meant. I didn't know what it meant at the time. I thought it was, and then it hit me. That's what it was. And then that got picked up as um, Asian Photography Magazine, an article on uh, being taken by pictures. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me how the power of what that beautiful woman said stays with you. And you just like life, you never know when the meaning or when the power of that's going to strike. And we talk a lot about your mission to build schools. And I think that's just an amazing thing, you know, to educate people in photography and teach. And uh, another uh, beautiful photo. Yeah, but yeah, I do yeah. have to say all of these pictures are amazing. But this is one of my favorites of yours. I mean, there's so many that I love, but I just I love the layers. I love the tone. I love I love the composition. It just all kind of comes together. And there's so much going on but it's just so simply pleasing. Talk about this. Okay. The native file size of this picture is uh, 30, 44 by 36. Okay. okay. I want you to hold that. It's shot with a D70. Mm -hmm. All right. Way back when. Yep. Way back when. So when it's all said and done, it has the equivalent resolution of... 120 megapixels. Mm -hmm. What you're looking at is 27 individual frames captured with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens at 200 to replicate the angle of view of a 28 millimeter lens because I was asked to do a 44 by 36 inch print for mm -hmm. the Lexar booth and then to sign prints, which I think we signed this as a Nikon print when we used to sign prints. Mm -hmm. And what it was, was solving some problems of resolution and solving some problems of um, construction and panoramas. So what you're looking at is you're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six, I think eight, individual panoramas that are then stacked on top of each other. Wow. And the lessons on this were all lenses have the same depth of field. Okay. <laughs> because if the aperture is set at F8, which the aperture was, whether I, or, which is critical aperture for that lens, whether I'm zoomed in at 200 or whether I'm zoomed in at 70, the angle of the, the lens will have the same depth of field. It's defined by, the the aperture okay mm -hmm. that telephoto lenses appear to have shallower depth of fields and wide angle lenses because of the angle of view the smaller objects are the more in focus they appear to be the blurrier objects are the less in focus they appear to be well i needed to get enough resolution to be able to make that big print and i had no idea how and i hate the ring and i am freezing my butt off underneath the tree in cold rain so I had to solve the problem of how to do this and how I solved the problem of how to do this is what's not going anywhere, the trees, what's going somewhere, the clouds. Okay. So I photographed the clouds first. And one of the interesting things, if you have a lens that has a foot on it, put that on the tripod because what that is, is that's frequently the nodal point of the lens, which means that if you're going to pan or do a, a pano and move it, 
the objects will stay in relationship to each other. They won't cross forward or back. Great. Didn't know that. Learned that at the time. Wanted the angle of view of 28 millimeters. I'm about two miles away from that church spire. Zoomed in on it. And so I created the image that way. And there's a rule in composition uh, Joseph Albers came up with that patterns are interesting, but patterns interrupted are more interesting. Right. And you if I remove that. the church spire out of the image, it becomes basically a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. But if I interrupt the organic patterns with the church spire, all of a sudden what happens? The picture becomes more interesting. Again, we also look at, to get back to your question about color, warm colors in an image move forward. So all of the colors in front of the picture have more warmth, more yellows and reds, and mm -hmm. more saturation than the ones behind it, which are very, uh, fade out into pastel. So they go from right. less to less to less to not. So what happens is those warm colors move forward, the cool colors recede, and we create the optical illusion of um, depth. And this right. is one of those pictures that does not want to be printed small. It yeah, wants to be printed at least 44 by 36, if not bigger. And the bigger you make it, the more that optical illusion occurs. Mm -hmm. Did you say where you took it? Where'd you take this picture? In Vermont. Oh, over beautiful. by Jenny Farm. Uh, on the way to Jenny Farm. So we got time for this one last picture. So talk about this again. I love, we talked about color before. Why did you pick this picture uh, as part of what you wanted to present here? Because there's something I think that's important that people don't do and they ought to do. And, it's, and uh, I'm not going to make it sales pitchy, but this is true for everybody's camera. Okay. In that bazillions of dollars were spent on the things inside a camera that nobody uses because for whatever reason we don't like we think that manual is better than aperture priority et cetera et cetera et cetera so i got this bug up my posterior um to do one camera one lens and i'm going to use a prosumer dx camera the reason why i did that was i was tired of hearing people tell me well, your work is so much better because you use nothing but, you know, whatever the highest end camera is. And I went, that's not true. So I used the, the 7200, uh, 28 to 300 millimeter lens, 70 to 200. And I shot that for six months for every job I did, everything I did. Well, mm -hmm. that idea is all well and good until you hit a certain point and then you go, now what? And I was having a conversation with uh, Paul Van Allen, who is um, a PMTR. Or yeah, he's, a, he's a pro rep, yeah. Paul's been with Nikon for quite a while, yep. Okay, and he's the Encyclopedia of Nikonia. Whenever I have a problem, I call him up. So mm -hmm. I say, so now what? And he goes, well, have you tried the scene modes in the camera? What's that? And he goes, you know, a bazillion dollars was spent on the guts of this camera and proceeds to Tell me about all these different things that the camera does. So I figured, okay, I'll give that a shot. Mm -hmm. I got nothing better to do. And I was up in San Francisco staying in a friend of mine's place who he had a, a 35,000 square foot warehouse that he had bought and was paying less mortgage than he was in rent when he was renting and he makes portfolio cases. And he only needed 5,000 square feet for his business so the rest of this was this giant open warehouse with skylights that hadn't been cleaned since the place was built mm -hmm. i went to the farmer's market and apparently it was heirloom tomato day because there were heirloom tomatoes as mm -hmm. far i mean just you couldn't everybody had them so i just bought all these heirloom tomatoes and i just decided well it's colorful and i brought them to the um warehouse and the light beam started coming through the window and I set them all up and then I put it in the scene mode for miniature. And what you're looking at is the lens that I used, the 28 to 300, wide well, open. 7200. I just want to clarify that so people don't think you use the 7200 lens and a, you know, 28 right. to 300. It's a D7200 camera. Got it. Okay, so it's a DX lens, DX 24 megapixel DX camera using mm -hmm. a built-in scene mode to do that miniature thing, 
right? That right. everybody, the tilt shift miniature thing. And I played with that. And what I wound up getting was this. And I was just blown away by mm -hmm. the quality of the color. And un the more I understood the tool, the better off I was, which is why I am always hell bent now to go after understanding every new bell and whistle in the camera. For example, something called focus shift. Mm -hmm. um, I used to do this thing called image harvesting and I developed this whole technique on it and wrote chapters on it and tutorials on it. And mm -hmm. Camera manufacturers came out with focus shift, which is the camera automatically slices through up to 300 pictures. You put me out of business. Stop it. Which, no, no, no. You put me out of business. You want to know what I have to say to that? <laughs> yeah. Yes. There you so go. There's your, I, there's your bouquet again. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 you're glad I could, I could help. And I, I was, I'm so thankful that my life has been made easier by sure. tech and by understanding what it is that I can do. Or like uh, when I do portraits now, I put the camera in facial recognition, follow focus in silent mode and use a remote. Mm -hmm. So the subject has no idea they're being photographed so I can get the absolute most spontaneous photograph. In absolute spontaneity, you get absolute truth. You can only be one way if you're spontaneous. Right. That's truthful. So when I'm done shooting, to date, every photo shoot ends with, so are you going to start? To mm -hmm. which I say, we're done. Well, what do yep. you mean we're done? You never took a picture. Well, you know, so that's all I've been doing. And so the technology has become a way to make me realize the better photographer in me. It, it's not something in the way. It's something that becomes the pathway. And the more I understand it, the more I get to use it. I mean, right. if your vision of the world is all I want to do is pick up the camera, shoot it, and then make a print of it, that's great. If that's your aesthetic and that's what you want to do, I applaud you. But there's so much more that can be done. And there's so much more that can be released within you if you understand the tools that you're working with and not be intimidated by them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, sure. that's me. Let me uh, bring you back uh, full screen here. Um, wow, that was a lot. We covered a lot, you know, I think a little over an hour. Um, but uh, some really, really great stories. And uh, really, Vince, I can't thank you enough for, uh, for coming and spending some time with us because I think a lot of people are going to walk away with a lot of good uh, understanding about photography and approach and color and, <laughs> uh, and, 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 how, um, and how your process works. And I know we could probably talk about this stuff for hours, but thank you so much for your time. Always, always there, always here, anytime you need me. Beautiful. And um, guys, those of you tuning in, thank you guys so much. You can check out Vincent's stuff on Instagram. What's your handle, Vincent, for Instagram? Vincent underscore Versace. Check it out. He's got his website, uh, Vincent Versace. Versace. It's a digital. What, what's Versace the? Uh, photog Versacephotography.com. Gotcha. Um, and um, uh, just amazing, amazing work. We thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, again, our mission here is to inspire you. Uh, to uh, as, as we come to the end of the pandemic, listen to what Vincent said. Get out there and shoot some great, great pictures. Check out NikonUSA.com backslash Creators Hour in case you missed anything over the last several months uh, as we've carried this on for a couple of months here. And uh, by all means, uh, get out there, create, share your images with us. We want to see them all. And, uh, and we thank you so much for tuning in. So for Nikon, I'm Mike Corrado. Everybody out there, be safe. Shoot some great pictures, and we'll see you soon. Peace.